I'm Terry Paddock. Very, very, very pleased to be back here um, to chair another post-show session with Proposal Theatre and um, start the new exciting season of the Lion and Unicorn. Um, so, uh, just a few things. Um, uh, we have about half an hour um, to talk, and we're going to talk about flashbang to start, um, and then we are going to talk about other exciting things coming up here at Lion and Unicorn. Um, and all I ask is, um, and we're going to make it interactive, because um, that makes it more interesting. I can just sit up here and talk to these handsome men all by myself, but that would not be. But it's better if uh, you guys ask questions. And all I ask is if you could put your hands up and wait for me to call on you. We are recording this, and we're going to share it afterwards. Um, and we'd love for you to share it when we do. So um, just get you used to raising your hands. I have a few questions for you, audience. Who's on social media? Anybody on social media? Look, wow, that's a high, high percentage. Feel free to turn on your phones, but uh, please keep them on silent. Take photos, take video. Um, behind me, uh, David is always so professional with this. I have easily like just little signs, but there, uh, all the handles and whatnot up there. Um, if you are on Twitter, actually, um, I've tweeted recently, and so it's my favorite with because uh, all the actors here also on uh, Twitter, so you'll see their handles as well. So give them a shout out, please. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, who has seen a Proposa production for Dear the Lion Unicorn? Thank you. Okay, so you've got big fans here. <laughs> Um, uh, who in the audience is an associate artist? Is other work coming up? Is it here? Okay, great. So uh, you guys are also going to be have your say. So when we finish talking about this, I'm going to ask you to give me your elevator pitches, elevator pitches, and tell me what you're looking forward to doing. And I might even have you come uh, and step in front of my um, sophisticated camera operation. This is my this is my nephew, by the way, who's visiting from San Francisco. <laughs> So the, I think the, it's inspired by the people that we have all around us who are brilliant, fantastic, wonderful humans. Uh, and they may come from London and they may not come from London. Uh, quite a lot of us don't come from London, which is not a bad thing. Uh, but I think it's actually a part of like just putting on real heartfelt work 
that speaks to something that speaks to the human condition. So I'm not a massive fan of, of kind of obscure abstract stuff because we're in a little box of a pub at the end of the day. Right? You want to look at something and be like, I, I, I know that person, I like them, I don't like them, and I know why I don't like them, but I can understand why they feel the way they feel. And that's really it. Um, this is a break also today, uh, and that's kind of the work that we want to see, and that's kind of the ethos of the learning that happens. What was the second part of your question? Uh, I think that kind of that's good. <laughs> but, um, I, I am interested in the lens seems to be, feels to me like it is a character in the play either by its presence or its absence. Um, and in, um, uh, lately, you were in a shit cold town outside of London, but you, nobody wanted to be here. And, and here, it's almost like you're, uh, the characters are, are very accepting and, and kind of happy with being wherever they are. But let me put that into performers, and let me start with Fred and Henry, because you guys are both returnees for is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. So, um, what is it that um, excites you about the work? That, which ones, which plays were you in before? And um, so I was in late last year. Yeah, I, know. I, was in, uh, <laughs> I was in five eight. Five eight. Okay. Okay. And what were you excited about the prospect of coming back to work on another proposal? Yeah, big time. Um, five A was was interesting because I don't know if anyone saw it, but like it was different each night and. While I've been in it, it was only for one night, I was in it, um, which was really great, but it was nice to come back and actually work for a prolonged period of time at the concert. Um, that was a whole proper rehearsal process with David and then actually doing like, a sustained amount of, of shows. So it's nice to come back, but refreshing because I'm coming back, but in a slightly different way. So that's, it's really nice yeah, to kind of properly set myself in here and stuff. Yeah. And Fred, you, when you did um, lately, it was so interesting, wasn't it? Because it's a two hander. Yeah. Right, and we're still doing social distancing, still kind of finding our way through the pandemic. Yeah, two casts as well, because obviously one of us got hit then without someone to kind of step in and, you know, fill those shows, so we didn't have, you know, nice off with people yet mm. down in their deathbeds, basically. But, um, <laughs> no, it was really nice to come back, I think, because it was like, the idea of coming back for like a, you know, whole new cast, whole new idea, like, different energies, different dynamics, like, it was just really interesting. And I had such a good time being there last time, but it was just impossible to say no, really. Perfect. Okay, so, uh, Emmanuel, Ryan, what did you guys think when... Did you know anything about Christmas before you started doing this show? Uh, well, I had auditioned for Volcano, actually, um, oh. beforehand, so we had, like, a slight encounter. But, um, no, uh, apart from that, I think... <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, no. Apart from that, I think coming back again, I heard the premise of this story, and I think I was just really drawn to it. And I, I thought, I spoke to my agent, and I was like, please get me in the room. What, what drew you to it when you read the script? I think the main one of the big scenes for me is actually your monologue. It's the tub dumping. That was like one of the first monologues I read in the whole thing, and I I cried. I cried in my in my bedroom when I read it because it's so. I thought it was so raw, and I had friends like that from back home, and I, it just, to me, it just really grabbed me, and that was the moment I was like, I really want to be part of this project, yeah. Yeah. And how about you, Sam? It's Ryan number one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, interesting, really. Um, I haven't worked with David before, but I've known about Pro Forza and the Lion Unicorn as a venue for, for ages. Um, and we got the uh, the same monologue through that, that one and as soon as the second line of flame about like carrying bag in the wind was such like a such like a visceral like I really hate but love that line. Um, and then I come from I'm like one of these boys, you know what I mean? Like I'm from a small town outside of Bristol and I just see like my friends in them and I like and I just wanted to be a part of it. The only thing that was interesting what you were saying a minute ago about the switching of London and how these boys really accept that, like, and they really want to be nowhere else. That was the most, that was the first third one, I think, um, of like connecting with the characters. It's like my immediate response is to be like, I want to be a London person and go to London and move away. One of those London one of those, people. Yeah, that's why the joke was, that's why, that's why the joke was, was funny, I thought, because that was all of us. But, um, they, they, they really just, they're just happy where they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, ladies, I'm going to 
to them. Because I'm me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, you're the only one that has a name. <laughs> I was looking at the flyer, but I couldn't see the sound design. Who did that, and like, how did you go about like creating the whole vision for the production, sound set, and all of that? Like, uh, if I can ask. Ah, you. okay, director, tell us about that. So we do it all in house. Um, we the reason we do that is because it's like a toolkit stuff that you have. I think when you make pub theatre or theatre above pub or just theatre, as I prefer to call it, because I think that sometimes I think there's a bit of a weird stigma attached to the word pub theatre when it goes up into it. I want to throw that word out or embrace it and, and it's a really good thing. Um, but the tech and the sound and the lights and stuff is part of our toolkit, it's part of the director's toolkit. You should know how a screen works, you should know how the lights work, um, you should know how to tech this venue. Uh, I know if a light goes out, which patch of pattern in there is very good. Uh, and I think every director that comes in should have that knowledge and should have that understanding. So we did it through the process with some collaborators that came in uh, that are part of our team or part of our squad, but like, uh, yeah, we all kind of helped to create that together. Um, so yeah, in-house toolkit is the stuff. In other words, David does everything. <laughs> 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 Constantly kind of passing the baton between you. Yeah. Um, is that exciting? Is that frightening? What's that like? Slightly daunting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think there's definitely moments. I think first starting off, knowing that we were, because it's round one, round two, three, and four, yeah. um, but with all our individual names. And I think it was a slight daunting thing because you, you want to feel like you have time with a certain character. And, and flesh out all the parts of them, but then also having to then like remember you are still like an extension of Ryan and who he is. Mm. And it was like I think we did a lot of like we did a lot of warm ups and, and, and a lot of clicking games to kind of keep in that like headspace of like upbeat and never like faltering. So I think that really did help along the way to kind of like merge everything together. Mm. Yeah, it's like a combo, isn't it? Of having like kind of having to have like an overall personality. But then also individually having your own personalities within that overall personality. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like you've got a personality that is all similar, but then between the three of us, and there's like a little extra thing that just, just slightly differentiates it. Um, and I think that was, yeah, like daunting, but when you find it, it's interesting because it means you can sort of play about with it a little bit. Um, and then also, then you have yeah, the little bit of Mikey as well, stuff like that, yeah. which is like another. But that was, that was interesting because with Mikey not being sort of Ryan and then sort of shifting it. Moments of actually you were on mic as well, and sorry, but like when you're actually mic, it's like I think there was more of a separation because yeah. we really want to differentiate, differentiate that person because you don't know, see him. Yeah. So when you have moments to show him, I think you have to take the opportunity to, to, to really like establish him as that person. Fred, you're nodding along. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it just makes it really interesting because sometimes you get uh, nights where you feel like you've been more Ryan than you have been. Or other person sometimes, but it makes it a slightly different feel for each scene and it keeps it fresh, which is which is lovely. Like something people can't really ask for, but it's great. Yeah. And, and I was fascinated actually, Sam, um, watching you um, because when the other performers were voicing Ryan, it's almost like it's like they the way that you were responding to them mm. playing you, it's like you're responding to your own inner thoughts. Yeah. Is that is is that how you think about it? Yeah, it basically yeah. It was very like introspective in a way, and initially, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we spoke about it how it's Ryan's story, and initially, I think it was a monologue ish or something like that. Yeah, and I want to get, as I usually this song, I'm sure to give Jess some credit because uh, two years ago when we were kind of bringing the story together, it was a conversation about like, what does that look like? What does, and it was originally going to be a one person socially distance, this is my story, because we were only making one person shows at that point in time, right? Um, and now we can talk to each other. And be in the same space and that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, we just made a phone call and it was like, this would be so much more interesting if actually we smashed that story up and gave Ryan his mates. Uh, and I think that's why we couldn't do flashbanging originally because, you know, I don't know if anybody's seen there's a social media picture of 
we used to, or if you were in here, there was like a weird squash court on the floor <laughs> where people couldn't touch each other and couldn't look at each other. And if you went into the two meter space and the other person had to sort of like back out again. Um, so actually having, like rounding that story out and giving it that extra depth with those extra characters meant that we had so much more to play with. And uh, of course it means you get four brilliant actors to work with into that as well. Um, so yeah, that collaboration was really good. Yeah, I was super happy that um, those boys came into it because they gave so much as you were saying, like depth, but it's like you're watching your own story unfold. And then they all had such like rich characters and like we only obviously had like a very short rehearsal period. But watching these guys kind of like go through the difference between their character and when you just like drop into Ryan and how Ryan kind of deals with seeing his story being narrated, I guess. Um, yeah, it was nice. Yeah. But I'm very glad that these boys are here. Yeah. Mm. And uh, Jess Barton, give us a wave. <laughs> okay, I'm looking for hands. Is anyone feeling? There we go. Uh, uh, red dress. Um, I was wondering uh, when Flash Bang, the idea for it, was like birthed from. Where did that come from? What inspired the piece to be created in the first place? So uh, I am from Coventry in the Midlands. Uh, which is a town 20 miles from the middle of the river. Uh, and actually, in the process of creating that story, it's about those people that never want to go anywhere else, right? Um, my little brother uh, got married to uh, somebody that he's been in a relationship with for a very long time, they've got children. Uh, and they've had mates since they were two years of age, they went to nursery school together and now they're big, uh, grown up humans, uh, with humans of their own. Uh, and I think it's that thing of like, we, I think I said this to you before, it's kind of tying back to that London thing. I think we, as people that live in London, have escaped from those lives, right? We, I've said this, I'm not living in this town anymore, I'm going to go off and be a London person instead. But actually, it's a bit of a love letter to the places that we came from. We didn't want to go because both from London and, and as children and boys got to stick together, right? Um, but those towns are all right, right? They've got lives of humans and, and, you know, lives of their own, and that's really important. So that's where the genesis of that story came from. We see so many stories that come through this building that are like, London, like, oh God, I sound like one of those horrible stories. Um, those like London elite, metropolitan elite people, and that's not what we are, that's not our personality, that's not what we are, and that's really what drives that story. Well, so. I am. That being said, it's all about actually, you know, we should all be proud of the places that we come from as much as we possibly can, and that's what that story is. It's about those lads looking back and saying, you know what, my life's all right. And loads of these stories are like, no, your life's not alright because we, we were bigger and better and we moved to live and we made the most of our lives. But actually, it's a bit of an effort to reclaim it's alright if you live in yeah. Compton or live in Birmingham or Liverpool or wherever. Um, so, yeah. And um, more stories about the Midlands, always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you hear every night. Um, <laughs> thank you, David. Matthew, you had a question? Um, yeah, it was um, just touching on what you did earlier about um, playing Lion. Um, obviously, you have a person who was the photograph of Mikey. Was that before involved in the rehearsal process at all? That for the character of Mike it was quite clear physicality and rhythm. Was that character brought to life by an actor that you then removed from, or did you come up with that together? How did that happen? So he was never there. Okay. Um, and the reason that it was important that he was never there is because those other characters are quite strong characters in their own rights, right? So actually, uh, and we needed somebody at the end when we went through the rehearsal process that was like, what's actually missing? And I think to see him at the end, because you see him as this, and it's the real, it's the real Dan Nash. As, how old are you in that photograph? Uh, I want to say seven. It's a real seven-year-old who becomes a real person, and so actually, it's that it's, it's all of it's all of them. As, yeah, as it's lovely. It's full of furniture. <laughs> 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 so to embody him at the end, and when he appears, because it's just that point where it all comes together again, and those two photographs line up, and there's like a circularity to it, which I think we really needed. So whilst he wasn't there, uh, the brilliant thing about Dan sometimes is Dan gets a phone call from me, it's like Dan, I've got this weird thing that I want you to do. Are you okay? And he says yes, uh, which has happened more than once, uh, and we're very grateful. Um, but yeah, uh, I think to have the image of him at the end as something that, that they and you can remember was really important to that process. So. When you created him in the room yourselves, like his yeah. physicality. Yeah. 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 
but also I think it's a point to point about all oh, the other characters in the in the world, right? So there's some really carefully drawn out other characters, and there's a whole world that sits behind the show. So Shanice that runs the train shop, um, who is the very brilliant voice of Lauren Bergman. Uh, and then so Emmanuel doing an impression of Lauren doing an impression of somebody else is quite a thing to behold. Um, and Emmanuel gets like all of the other people, right? So you get the mums and the old ladies and the men downstairs and you know all of that sort of stuff. And I think having the other people in that world is really important. So like Ryan's mum and dad, there's a whole world built around these characters and I hope there's that sense of I love people that they meet. Right, big red face knowledge. Red. We all need <laughs> red face knowledge. Yeah. Did, did I imagine it, Sam? Did you just cross yourself when you said uh, Imagine it. I imagine it, right. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't imagine it, but I, I wasn't. It was to Dan, I've been a little bit. Okay, um, I have to ask this is the only female sat up here, but do you think there is something different about the nature of male friendship? Especially at that age. Yeah, like Fred's like, what? Yeah, I mean, yeah. They're, they're all just like, I think at the start, they're all just, they, they love each other to bits, but it's that thing of like, I'm never really going to explicitly be like, oh, mate, love you so much. Like, that's a, an odd thing to do sometimes, I think. So there's all these guys like presenting your feelings in different ways, you know, taking the piss out of each other and just, you know, all those shared memories and experiences you've got. So I think that's the way that they show it, and then they really sort of come together and actually really show how much they mean to each other after such a horrible thing happens to them and that's when you get the real them, I guess, yeah. underneath. Yeah, I think as they, uh, yeah, um, it, I think the way, I've got a line when I'm about to do the, when I'm in the trainer shop and it's just, we don't do that either, do we? Talk, I mean, and you can be any gender, any whatever and not, communicate your emotions, but I think it struck very well with us in terms of, like, in those kind of situations, like, you just, just, like, you just need to talk to each other. Everyone's going through, like, everyone's going through, like, the same situation. It's different, obviously, for each person. Everyone had their own relationship with Mikey at the World Time Rehearsals, but um, they just, and then you say about maybe that's what needed to happen to kind of, like, yeah, bring yeah. us all together at the end, and hopefully me means that people's lives are easier as they, as they go on because they are able to open up a bit more. Yeah. The other thing I think that we found during rehearsals is uh, what they don't say to each other is quite important as well as part of our friendship group. So I don't know if you know this, but there's at least one of them that is running away with somebody else to do things without telling you that they're going this trip to Birmingham where they're off to go to a gig together. Mm. It's that thing of like, they all, they all form another function. There's little groups inside them and there's kind of a bit of a secret, like secrets going on that they don't say. Which is the end of the that you have a friend you go to which you'll tell that person that one thing, but you won't tell that other person one thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you want somebody to steal some hay from Hector to Hyman, it's Ryan and it's Sarah Vita. If you want somebody to cry on, then it's somebody else. You know, and that's, I think, what's really important too about when those friendships are, four of them together, and when they are like two people together, and why that is, I think, is important too. Yeah. Um, so, um, we are going to talk about the season in a bit, in, in a moment, but any final questions about Flashbang? Okay, yes. Yeah, um, amazing performance, guys. I was entertained throughout. Um, one question, and like make it, the answer be precise. But what is one takeaway? Yeah, and like. <laughs> 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 um, what is one takeaway that? What is one thing you're taking away from either your rehearsal process or performance, the writing? Like, what is one thing you're taking away? From? One personal takeaway. Nice, I like it. Uh, Move, break that to go first. I'm like, you. Um, <laughs> I think, um, having such a short rehearsal period yeah. meant that you had to hit the ground running. So, but even going forward, even if I have a longer rehearsal period, I'm still gonna try and hit that first rehearsal with all the character work done, all the lines. Uh, but yeah, like hitting the ground running on day one with everything done to make most of the time. Nice, good lesson. Sam? Uh, same on the short rehearsal periods. I'm a bit of a like control freak and a prep freak, and I like to know everything is done. When you know that that can't happen, I just this process has taught me just to let go 
and know that we won't hit the ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, the, the, yeah, <laughs> just let go, let go, <laughs> and trust, trust the process. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think the thing I take away from this is it's the camaraderie of like the group, and I think it's it's like it's a big thing knowing like the energy we share in a room together, and like we've all gone through like its ups and downs with rehearsals, but at the same time, just being so present and looking around the room and being like, no matter what happens, these people around you have got your back. And I think that for me, the day I realized that and stopped being about like, oh, I need to learn my lines or learn my monologue, like the, me, 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 then I just felt like, like a lot more free. It just, it felt like a lot more fun to play, play with these lads, so yeah. Right. Uh, mine actually follows on really closely from that. It's that sense, that trust, definitely. Like it's, it's so nice knowing that, uh, like, on the off chance anything goes wrong, you know, you've got three people in the room who know you, how you work, how you operate, just as well as you do, and they can, they are there to help you. Like, and we could all do that for each other in a, like a in a moment, and that only adds to it because you go on stage with kind of fearlessness that. That you don't normally get. Normally, you're just like so wrapped with nerves that you're just like you're just like shaking in the dressing room, basically. But like it was, it's been so nice to to not have that, like to just trust them completely. Yeah, so it's a friend. You've got it's a real friendship. It's crazy, isn't it? Like, we literally, the, like you had six days of rehearsal to learn the dress room. So like, the bond, like there's nothing like acting in those rehearsal periods. Just to bring a group of strangers together. Just be ready for we're going to keep in touch after this. I think what's interesting is because we had such a short amount of time to kind of force us to like, yeah. you've got to get on. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but then we did it, which yeah. is the good thing as well. Like it was then just, we naturally did. So I think, you know, but also that's pretty done to cast time, right? But like, you might have to be ready. And also, I'm just casting, sorry, Susie Cabot was very responsible for the casting, a lot of that process. Susie, so this uh, way. More than once. <laughs> Um, I think it's trust to but the same thing, this trustful process, but trust this room. And I hope that this room hasn't let anybody else down so far in the last few years that we've been here. Um, this room will always catch you when you need it. The light will always go on. There will always be a yeah, drink downstairs. And um, yeah, it's just trust the room, trust the process. Trust the building, because the building will reward the love and care and effort you put into it in terms of its return, in terms of creativity that you have. Um, in the back. Uh, yeah, I'd just love to know like, individually uh, how close you found your characters to yourselves and was there a particular part of them or their personalities that was a good way in? Yes, and, <laughs> to, uh, and, and the, just to, you know, on a frivolous uh, aside, um, did you bring all your own dance moves? And then like instant like straight into Dino, Eastern and Zinia, basically. Like I think it was it's nice, like I know a lot of people who might have you know, I'm not gonna say who because <laughs> that got close mates to the plot. <laughs> yeah, there, there were a lot of people who kind of inspired me to, to make him that. So I think that's who he was, not other than me. Thank you, Henry. Um I think his music was the way in just because of it's very clear the sort of genre he likes, that's what I like the monkey's life and I I personally actually also don't really like the Arctic Monkey. <laughs> so, so using that sort of ideology with that sort of music, that was sort of my way in because it allowed me to tap into sort of slightly you know, grungier sort of vibe that, that he was looking for. He's a bit moody and get through stuff and wants to be by himself. So, yeah, I think the music was the way I sort of used my I would say, see, people would think it's me and Girls, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's more fun. We can talk about that later. <laughs> 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 um, I would say it 
They say it was more about like my family, especially in the monologue, like things like that when everyone meets up together. It, it, it's a big thing in like uh, in Jamaican and African cultures, and for me that was like such a key thing that I was like, I'm okay, I know who who he is now, and also like the way it's almost like a traditional thing that everyone just comes around and. Yeah, that for me was like, okay. Yeah. Mine was more, kind of touched on it earlier about um, my group of friends back home, and like, I love them to pieces, like I really love them to pieces. Love them to pieces. Um, <laughs> but I, when I got the script initially, I was casting the role, I was getting, I was like battling with how at PC is with like being from this small town and, and loving it, and I was, all my script notes were like, what was he conflicted with and blah, blah, blah. And as soon as I realized and spoke to David in that first rehearsal that like, nothing, like this is, as soon as I had that, I just looked at one of my best friends from back home and I was like, he loves where he is from. You know what I mean? Every time they get back into that little town, they're like, ah. So I went back home and did that. And then more about him. Oh, that's lovely. And are, are your friends coming to see the show? They love it so much, they rarely leave Bristol. Hi, so this is kind of, it's mainly for David, but also for you guys as well. Is, um, I, I've seen a few people's shows now, and I feel like quite a lot of your shows, for me at least, the, the way I see them, very much centre around kind of masculinity and the way that we view masculinity and relationships between men. And and I wonder, you know, is that intentional? And, and also, I guess for the guys, because you're all, you know, men in theatre, like, where do we, what, where do we go now with stories of masculinity in, in a 2022 audience? And, and, and how do they develop? What, where, where's their place for them now? That's a big old question. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm coming from somebody that makes very brilliant female-led work as well. Uh, it's important to address that question in the way that I think makes sense. Uh, which is, I think, you write, you create, you work with what you know, right, to some extent, because I think it would feel truthful. I mean, I think we've got some brilliant female characters in our pantheon, and I think that we try to put a female influence in. There's a line in Flashbang where he talks about all the brilliant women that I've got in my life. And there is a, there are some female influences in Flashbang, uh, but I think they're important to come through. Um, this story in particular, I think, is a very specific type of masculinity. It's a very specific type of... Uh, I hope they don't feel very, very like a gang of football hooligans on the train, because that makes me very sort of triggered in lots of different ways. And I live next to the West Ham ground, <laughs> uh, which means that my Saturdays and Sundays are always uh, exciting adventures of going home with like, you know, gangs of like football nights and stuff. Those aren't those boys, right? And I think it's really important that it's like a softer side that isn't banging people over the head with it. They're just normal, nice blokes that you like to tell stories about, I think. The way it's fallen just because of the pandemic and the way that it is, that's why those masculine stories have just lined up a little bit one after the other. It's not a statement of intent to be like, we're just going to make work about lads. That's not really the way it works. Uh, but uh, I can tell you maybe the next stuff coming up is very different and it's not only got a, female, a strong female influence, but it's got also above the age of 35. How's that? <laughs> did, you, um, did you see At Last? I didn't. No. Okay. That, yeah, that, I, I think, um, it, yeah, that was completely different. It wasn't about. Yeah, and feel, and so the characters in feel, for example, the feel more, the feel more, the, the female characters in feel more are, are like the, the best women that you've ever known or ever hang out with. You know, they're, they're really, <coughs> and that's really important too. So uh, we're giving the boys some time off uh, next year with some of us. Um, boys, did you want to add anything to that? It's, it's tricky. I think, like, in terms of. They have stories in 2022, obviously, it's, it's about still, I think, I mean, the stats are still something like 45% of their death to suicide, and I think it's just about still trying to break down that stigma of being able to talk about what you're feeling, and that it's okay to, to cry, you know. Um, but I think, it, I think it's often tricky being in the arts, because there's a lot of guys in the arts who who are in touch with their feelings, and that's why they're in the arts. And actually, I think, going forward, I think the issue that we need to do is if we want to sort of just continue attacking this issue of men talking about their feelings and getting upset, actually, we need to try and open the discussion out and actually get people involved in it who aren't in the arts, and who don't, aren't surrounded by that 
their entire lives because I mean all of my it's always tricky it's kind of like oh man people don't talk about their feelings I'm thinking like well, a lot of my friends do but then I, <laughs> and I forget actually that's because I'm in an incredibly niche environment and actually we need I think the next thing the next step that needs to happen is we need to be able to to reach the bits of society that aren't in that bubble whether that's you know football fans or whatever that's just a very easy one to shoot out from concept but you know I think that's where we've got to try and take it. How we do that, I don't know. Um, but I think that's sort of, maybe it's why more and more stories written about that sort of person so then they can see themselves in that and actually realize that, yeah, I can do this sort of thing. I don't know, but I think that's where we need to start looking in terms of stories. Lovely, thank you very much. Now, I really have overrun, but I think we should probably have we have more things to talk about than flashbang. So hands again, give me some associate artists. Okay, okay, I'm gonna start with, so we just do lucky, lucky bits. Yeah. Okay. Choose your favorite. Okay. Choose your favorite. Okay, I'm gonna go, okay, I'm just gonna go right, right. Okay, uh, here, tell me your name, your company, what are you excited about doing at Lime and Unicorn? Oh, well, hi guys, I'm Andrea Lingay. Um, I'm from Hidden Views Productions. Hidden Views with a Z because we're cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had just finished doing Happy Space on a PR, which had a similar kind of vibe as Splash Bang. It was a lot of like uh, men's mental health, suicide, but it was set in Disneyland. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we, we've got things coming. David doesn't know yet. <laughs> I'm about to knock on his door. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good. Who was the next hand coming up in the back? Yep. Hi, so my name's Will. I'm part of Find Out Theatre with uh, these two guys. And we did a play here two months ago, The Players of Diadem. And this, that was our first time in this theatre. Um, and in terms of what we've got coming up is we're in a period of rebranding. So we've got a new logo, a new website, and we're looking to engage with the community. So we're going to be doing uh, free drama workshops, especially in this like cost of living crisis where people are working more hours. And you know, I grew up, I grew up in Dudley, so I'm from West Midlands. <laughs> and my mum was always working, and I didn't really have a place to go. So we thought, you know what, we're going to create a program for kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, and kind of unless you're exposed to this sort of stuff, you don't think there's a place for you. So that's what we want to do at Hideout. We want to like inspire more people to, to get into it. Great. Yeah. Next turn. Yeah. Hi everyone. I'm, I'm Abby. This is Gabby. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, so we are two people of Lady Garden Theatre. Uh, you have to be careful when you Google it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Last year, we did a show here called uh, Shakespeare's Mad Women. I love that it's a Shakespearean fuckboys. Um, <laughs> just a about how much I hate Hamlet and I think it's a prick. Um, and uh, then now we're R and D two shows. Uh, a show called Greedy, which is a cabaret show about bisexuality. Uh, back when I didn't realise I was a lesbian. Um, <laughs> and another show which is called um, Eliza Talks to You What Her Mother's Dead Bodies in the Wardrobe. Um, <laughs> And we make a feminist theatre through like a queer lens. And yeah, that's what we're doing at the moment. I <laughs> love that. <laughs> I'm so yeah. um, I'm Olivia, this is Susie. We are Fantastic Garden Theatre. We've got a show coming up in November called La Mopan, which is all about Julie Daubney, who was a real life um, 17th century bisexual sword fighting opera singer. <laughs> um, and it's a kind of punk folk retelling of the story.
very, very keen on. Thank you, Jess, and give my love to Ross. Um, yes, here. Hi. Do the whole thing like that. You literally get to do I'm Brooke, this is Holly, we're from Hooked. Um, we usually host Scratch Nights here, which is like comedians. We do some spoken word character comedy pieces, play extracts, um, but we are looking to do a run hopefully next year. Um, it's going to be super silly. Definitely next year. <laughs> but, yeah. And, um, yeah, next year. Uh, it's going to be a sketch show, it's going to be really silly, really ridiculous, probably about irritable bowels. Um, and yeah, we're really excited. We've just finished um, filming a TV pilot called Cabbies. We screened that here at one of our scratch nights, which went really well. And yeah, it's, it's definitely a work in progress, but we're hoping to take it to Edinburgh as well. So yeah, if you like silly stuff, then come and see us. Yeah. <laughs> How do you finish each other's sentences? <laughs> uh, behind. Yep. Hi, I'm Olivia. This is Alex. Uh, we are the Tiny Dance Company. Um, similar to the characters in Flash Band, we're both from small towns in the north. Moved to London nearly nine, 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 ten years ago. Met at we met in training together and created a theatre company four or five years ago. We've done a few productions at Lion and Unicorn now. Um, we did a few scratch nights and then most recently we put on our two woman show, 67. We debuted it here last December and then came back again in June. Um, and now we'd really like to take it um, to some northern love theatres and kind of tour it because we, we really enjoy doing it here. Lovely. Okay, there was still more news. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I'm Grace, this is Kieran and this is Michael and we're all part of Moonloaf. Uh, so we've done four shows here I think at the Lion Unicorn now uh, and on the 18th of September we are doing a one night only fundraiser. Moonloaf, uh, the night after they finish? Yes, the very night after they finish. Um, so Kieran is running the London Marathon and he's raising money for Whiz Kids, the charity. Uh, and we're going to do sort of like a play in a day kind of thing. Uh, How's the training going? It's going well. I ran 15 miles yesterday and I can't really walk today, so <laughs> maybe currently. Yeah. 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 A couple of weeks, so. Between <laughs> <laughs> five. Three um, <laughs> little cigarettes outside, not the yeah. Um, yeah, the concept of the evening on the 18th is that we're doing a play in 24 hours, but it's not 24 hours, it's 26.2 hours, because that's how long the marathon is. Yeah. Yeah. Clever. It is clever. Um, so, <laughs> the, uh, the audience give us suggestions 26.2 hours before the show to tell us what the title is going to be, what the genre is, what the character's name is going to be, and then we make a show in that time. All proceeds go to charity, so when it's not very good, that's not our fault. You can't <laughs> shout at us. You can't it's shout fine, at us. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what we do. Thanks. Now, did I miss anybody? And two boy aren't here. They and two boy aren't here. They are having a hard reset. They were here yesterday, and they sent me a report. Okay. We send them um, our love to them. So wind this all together. Tie it all together for us, David. What? Um, what are you most excited about? Uh, with the upcoming season, and should we just come and see everything? I mean, you should always come and see everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the brilliant thing about these people is that the Line of Unicorn is uh, all of the companies that come and make work here. And, but it's the work that we make is to do, has, everybody has involved in it, right? We go off on Madcap Adventures and Kieran throws himself in the sea before you do a show in the UK. Uh, CZ is involved in the casting, Jess is involved in you know, all of uh, everything that we do. The Associate Artist Programme is woven into the fabric of this building and the building is only successful because of that Associate Artist Programme. We are, we, I am one human with some of the brilliant humans. One so super human. Back. Um, but also, you know, we, we, you know, you talked about the journey at the beginning, we said right at the beginning that the Rhino Unicorn would have a really strong Associate Artist program because that would be the ten peg work ten peg work and to go back to your very first question at the beginning about the type of work that we want to make they all do different things brilliant things wonderful things magic things uh, and I think that this building is what it is because of all of those people and everything that they do right um, you know I think that as the artistic director you can stand behind that group of people and say that these are the best that we have to offer the London brilliant humans and this is like you stand next to them and go go I'll open the doors, the little water, you can turn the lights on, please turn them off afterwards. Uh, please bring a technician. 
Um, all of those, sort of that way. but you turn up and it's like this is the this is the, the building. We are the people that are here, and I think we I hope we all support each other. Um, so it's actually the building. And you know, I go back to what I said about supporting the process. The building will support you. The building should support you. I hope it has, uh, and we will continue to do that. And as we change and evolve a little bit, we've had. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned Abby earlier, and, and, and the to the back. Uh, it's that thing of like. I called Abby the day of everything was shutting down, and I was like, I'm really sorry your show is not going to go ahead today because of the pandemic. But hold on 12 months and you'll be here and it will be fine, and, it, and blow it and does it was. And I think those experiences have really powered our journey throughout the last three years. Um, and so the Associate Artists Programme is fucking marvellous. And it's really what makes this building a special place to be, and it's what makes my job wonderful. Uh, when sometimes it's a bit shit. And what I mean by that is just the logistics of navigating a world where, you know, you have the death of a monarch on press night of your show, <laughs> or, you know, you have a pandemic, or like any of those things that happen, they're big world-changing events and we're all still here. And we all, came, we all came through the pandemic together, and we will be here as long as it needs to be here. Yeah. That's it. I know, that, no, 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 I know that sounds like an assault line, isn't it? <laughs> 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 Maybe for a moment, because I control these things. Um, uh, we are all part of the line in the community. I killed yeah. myself. Um, uh, I'm going to claim that. So we all get to answer the final question, which is the most important question of the night. Who loves Chumbawamba's? <laughs> you get knocked down. And who, who loves it? Yeah, yeah. The song? Yeah, Who loves yeah. the song? Yeah, Who hates the song? Who hates the song? Oh, haters be gone. I don't want to 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 be gone. Thank you.